So it puts me in mind of a question I got asked it when I was too kicked to doing a talk at a sit from college once, and one of the kids who'd been glowering at me from the back row, he put his hand up right at the end. He was like, "Yeah, Mister, if you know all this about money laundering, why don't you just go and do it?" <laughs> and and I still don't know what the answer to that is. It was a really, it's the best question I've ever been asked. I think、mm. about it like every week. It's a brilliant question. Where has all the money gone? My entire adult life, the government has presided over spiralling inequality, huge corporate profits, sky-high rents, and astronomical property prices. And yet, for all this wealth, we're told that it is impossible to tax it or redistribute it in the form of wages or increased public spending. And this feeling that. All the money is being extracted, taken away from ordinary people, and squirrelled away where governments can't access it. Is not something that's unique to the UK. Every year, something like one trillion dollars is stolen from poor countries and stashed in richer ones. And this is actually something that the UK is uniquely good at. Facilitating that process of concealing wealth and providing a range of services so that the super rich can enjoy it. So I wanted to find out why we got so good at laundering dirty money. And to learn more about it, I'm joined by Oliver Bullo, the author of Moneyland and Butler to the World. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I mean, basically, I want you here for financial advice because, let's say, hypothetically.、Mm-hmm. I have a load of money which I've skimmed from my role as a government official,、mm-hmm. um, and I want to hide it somewhere、Great. so that it can't be taxed.、Okay. Uh, but also, I want to be able to access it so I can buy, like you know, a solid gold yacht and、mm. stuff like that. What do I do? Okay. Well, I mean, so your primary concern, obviously, you don't want to be taxed. I mean,、mm-hmm. that goes without saying. But your primary concern is probably more making sure no one. Knows that you've got the money because although you might be in a solid position now with regards to the people running the country, in five years you might not. So,、mm-hmm. so yes, tax is important, but that's the secondary importance. Really need to hide it. Yeah, keep me out of jail. Exactly, keep you out of jail. Keep you out of the headlines as、mm-hmm. well, because that's just as bad. Because you know you don't get to go to the bougie parties if you're known as a kleptocrat. So, so you need to route your money via jurisdictions that don't ask too many questions.、Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm gonna say you're from the former Soviet Union、mm-hmm. because you might be.、Mm-hmm. Um, Cyprus is very welcoming to your、mm-hmm. money,、uh, Malta also, but Cyprus is very welcoming.、Um, but you don't want to have it in your own name because <clears throat> if it's like you know your own name on the bank account, then it's easy to follow. So, so you need to set up a shell company.、Um, Britain's good for them.、Mm-hmm. Uh, a limited partnership based in Edinburgh. Owned in turn by companies based in tax havens, no one's going to find out who like, owns that. How easy would it be for me, somebody who struggles with two-factor authentication on Twitter, to set up a shell company? Can you buy things on Amazon? Yeah. Yeah, you could do it. So it's that straightforward. Easier, actually. Yeah.、Um, I mean, it, you know, it, it's there's a series of drop-down menus. I mean, but th- this is changing, or possibly changing. But right now, you can create a company. No one checks any information you provide. So I was doing it with a friend the other day, and she's a tax consultant. And wanted tax consultant from the drop down menu, but that wasn't an option. So she went for taxidermist.、Um, <laughs> but that's fine.、Um, so so you've got your shell company. Your shell company owns your bank account,、um, and at that point, your money now doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to a company. The company can be called anything. It could be called, you know, Mafia Holdings Limited. Some of them are. For, because amusing,、um, or it could just be called, you know, Strategic Solutions Limited, which is probably be- more better idea. And then you just start bouncing the money around. So move it from there to a bank in in Malta, from there to a bank in Germany. From Germany, you could probably bring it to the UK. You bring it to the UK. You know, we have yacht brokers here. I don't know if they have solid gold yachts, but <laughs> but they have yachts, nice ones.、Um, and they can once you've got the yacht, there are also yacht interior designers here. Who will? And、um, there was one guy I was reading about recently who managed to consume the entire world's annual supply of mother of pearl. What? Interior decorating his yacht. So you can go for that.、Um, and also we do super yacht captains here. We have one of the great things about Britain、um, is to to bring your money to Britain. Is that unlike other countries that have corruption services, we have them all. So <laughs> we don't just do a little bit like hiding your wealth or selling a shell company or or whatever. We can provide. Soup to nuts, 
move your money here, invest your money here, hide your money here, spend your money here, and protect yourself here. Because look, there are annoying people like me who who feel the need to write about kleptocrats and oligarchs who've stolen vast wealth. And that's annoying. So we also have defamation lawyers who you will be able to pay and they will protect you against people like me. And then we have uh, accommodating politicians who will accept your money, uh, invite you to the right parties, possibly with time, give you a seat in the House of Lords. Um, we have accommodating universities that will accept your donations and then you will become known as a philanthropist, <laughs> not as a kleptocrat at all. And this, you know, it sounds like a lengthy process. You could get all this done from entry-level kleptocrat to noted philanthropist in four or five years. I mean, so who who would you say followed that model? Would it, would it be a name that our viewers would know? I mean, for because of the uh, nature of the uh, defamation industry, I tend to be a bit reluctant to name individuals. Are you um, ever allowed to say what their names rhyme with? <laughs> I mean, one guy I've written quite a lot about, though I should say he's never been convicted of a crime and denies any wrongdoing, is a gentleman called Dmitry Firtash, who is a Ukrainian uh, businessman who made an astonishing amount of money as the business partner of the Kremlin's gas company, Gazprom, uh, selling gas to Ukraine um, uh, very with an elevated price in order to um, uh, give a sort of political response to the fact that Ukraine had, had a revolution. He made a huge amount of money. He brought that money here. Um, within four years, he'd gone from unknown business person to meeting the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, he was welcomed to the Guild of Benefactors of Cambridge University, who, who gave him a medal for his uh, outstanding philanthropy. He bought himself a mansion uh, just down the road from Harrods, um, right by Holy Trinity Brompton. Um, in 2014. Because yeah, you always want a local shop. Well, exactly. Harrods is just over the road. I mean, it's still annoying to cross over at the lights, but still, <laughs> it's not that bad. Um, 2014, our government sold him a tube station. He is, as far as I know, the only private owner of a tube station. Which in tube station? Brompton Road. It hasn't been open as a tube station since the 30s, but it's still, obviously, it's got that, you know, that weird, shiny red uh, tiles on the front. So you can still tell it's a tube station. But annoyingly for him, um, tragically for him, he never really got to enjoy his tube station. I'm not entirely sure what he was planning to do with his tube station, <laughs> but he never really got to enjoy it because um, just... Uh, two and a half weeks or so after the, the, the sale was announced, he was uh, indicted by the Americans who have a less accommodating view of kleptocrats than we do. Um, and he's been a battling extradition from Vienna ever since. So he's he's stuck in Vienna and doesn't get to enjoy his tube station or mansion. Um, but I would say he's a really extraordinary example of how if you have a lot of money, no one in this country really cares where it comes from. And we provide not just sort of money services, but the whole spectrum of become an aristocrat, um, you know, services, cosplay Bridgerton, if you want to. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that was really striking about reading your book is just how much wealth seems to be owned by nobody. You can't find a name or an identifying feature on any document. So I think there was 86 properties on Eaton Square, which is one of the most expensive um, addresses in, in the entire country. Um, would you describe this as a you know regulatory snafu or is this a design feature of the british economy so i mean eaton square is kind of a ground zero in england and wales there are something like 90,000 properties uh, sort of owned offshore property titles which is actually more than 90,000 houses probably more like 150,000 houses mostly concentrated in the the tonier bits of london sort of you know belgravia knightsbridge that kind of area um and then on top of that, you've got a very large number of properties, probably 250,000 or so, which are owned by foreign registered individuals, many of whom have a slightly suspicious looking addresses in tax havens. So they may well be essentially shell people who don't actually own the property. They're just putting their name on the documents to hide the true owner. So you're talking about hundreds of thousands of properties, overwhelmingly in the most expensive postcodes in the country, owned by who knows who. Um, and this has been going on for absolutely ages. Um, is it a conspiracy? I'm not a massive believer in conspiracies. I don't think from what I've had to do with government that there's anyone probably competent enough to have kept this secret for as long as it's been kept secret. But there is something which is kind of conspiracy adjacent, whereby if something is very profitable for a sufficient number of influential people, no one asks very many questions about it. I mean, isn't, is there sort of a space between conspiracy and accident where what you have is 
a system which almost emerges organically in response to certain incentives and things which are getting prioritized and things which are not getting prioritized. It's, it's a function of power. Yeah, I mean, Mansur Olsen has this theory that democracy isn't rule of the majority, it's rule of the committed minority. And I think that you have a, a, a very well-networked lobby group who exists to move money around and they earn substantial fees from doing so. And they don't really ask too many questions about whose money it is because then they'd have fewer fees. Um, I think that that, I mean, it's undeniable that that exists. And it has been a really important part of Britain's economic trajectory since the 1950s, since the the really, you know, when empire was ending. I mean, it wasn't quite the end of empire because obviously we still had colonies going into the 60s and 70s, but the the big ones were going in the 50s. Obviously, India had already gone mm. and Pakistan and Bangladesh and and then, you know, Ghana was going and so on. So it was it was really the beginning of decolonization. And, you know, Britain having been the oligarch, right? You know, what Putin's doing to Ukraine now, that's what we used to do. If we didn't like a country's trade policy, we'd send in the Navy until they changed their minds. And, you know, but having lost that role as the biggest bully on the block, we needed a new thing to do. And we still knew how to be the biggest bully on the block. So we could sell bullying services or butlering services, as I call it, to other people. So other people who wanted to, you know, steal countries, um, which was something we were very good at. Um, they could come to us for advice and having done it, we would help them, you know, keep and enjoy the money. And, um, you know, it, it's funny, we we talk a lot about, you know, how awful it is that, you know, Russian oligarchs having looted their countries come here and buy, you know, properties in West London and, and influence politics and so on. And, and it is awful. But if you read the history of, you know, the acquisition of the British Empire in India mm. about how British officials became astonishingly wealthy, looting a country and brought their money here, bought properties in West London and entered Parliament. You know, it isn't that different, to be honest. In fact, it's pretty much exactly the same right down to the postcodes. Well, so, we essentially got Singapore through white collar crime. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, you, you have a, one of the things I think is really interesting about the British Empire and, you know, and, and it's, it's really good that because of people like William Dalrymple writing about it now, um, and Satnam Sanghera and, and others, that there is far more understanding of this than there was, and I'm hoping that there'll be more history about it, um, is how the British Empire, though we call it the British Empire, to begin with was more the City of London's empire. Mm. You know, the who conquered Canada? Well, that was the Hudson Bay Company. You know, who traded slaves? That's the Royal Africa Company. You know, who conquered India? The East India Company. Um, so you had city companies going out not because they wanted to conquer large chunks of the world for the sake of it. They wanted to conquer large chunks of the world because it was incredibly profitable. And so, you know, that the, the fact that the city of London was the financial engine of the British Empire, um, when the British Empire ended, it, it still had that instinct to be a financial engine. It, moving money, you know, doing deals was, was in, its, in the DNA of the structures in the City of London. It was what the Bank of England wanted to see happening. It was what banks wanted to do. And, and if you couldn't do those trades in pounds anymore, because the pounds was no, pound was no longer the international currency, you know, from the 1950s, they began doing those trades in dollars. And this is, you know, the birth of this dollar market in the City of London, whereby banks started using dollars to finance transactions instead of pounds, is this extraordinary moment when bankers here realized that by using dollars, they evaded simultaneously British and American restrictions. They evaded American restrictions because they were doing the trades in London, and they evaded British restrictions because they weren't using pounds. And they created this rules-free, regulation-free space, um, which they needed a term for, um, a legal term. And, and there is an existing legal term for a regulations-free space. It's what happens if you get in a boat and go out of reach of land. So they called it offshore. Um, so offshore is an invention in the city of London. Um, to as a loophole to enable people to evade the restrictions imposed by the governments in the same way that you could evade them by being a pirate and going out to sea. I mean, I was reading Butler to the World kind of in tandem with a book by Kojo Karam called Uncommonwealth. And yeah, it's it, a great book. it seems to me that there's this shared thesis, really, which is this move for the British economy where it's like, what we're going to do is be a midwife for the world's dirty money we're going to help launder it we're going to help whitewash it we're going to you know help legitimize it is that seeing that as a continuation of how trade worked under empire but it was also a sort of substitute for the, for the lost status of empire and one of the things that 
you know, Kojo says as well, okay, well, why, why is uh, the British Virgin Islands or the Cayman Islands, which were seen as sort of nowhere places, you know, valueless territory, why did those become the tax havens? It's because we lost Jamaica, which was sort of the, the economic engine of the Caribbean. I mean, so for you, where, where does the conversation about empire start? Do, do you sort of go back and trace a direct lineage from the Hudson Bay Company and the East India Company? Or are you looking more at the moment where status is lost? Well, I mean, there is a, there is a, a it's a transition. So going from the early 20th century, I could talk about this for hours, it's so interesting. Go for it. <laughs> the, going from the early 20th century when Britain's period of relative decline begins, you know, Manchester and Lancashire is no longer the engine, the manufacturing center of the world. We, we start being outcompeted by industry in Germany and industry in the United States and industry in Japan and elsewhere. Um, so there's a relative decline in, in you know, British coal mining, in British, you know, machine tool manufacturing, British shipbuilding and so on. But, but the, the city of London retained its primacy um, not just as as the sort of facilitator for financial transactions for the British Empire, but also for quite a large informal empire, places like Argentina, um, quite a lot of South America, actually, places like China, which obviously, you know, Hong Kong was British, but there was quite a lot of China, which was significantly dominated by British finance, but which wasn't formally British. So so there was already, in a way, the, the shadow of the, of the system that was to come, which was that after we ceded formal control of these territories, we retained control of the financial flows from them. Um, and, you know, if you look at the, the nature of the government of, say, Nigeria under British rule, you know, what was it there for? It was there to extract value from Nigeria and send it to Britain. Um, and then if you look at the government of Nigeria after independence, it didn't take their politicians very long to realize how profitable it was to extract value from Nigeria and send it to Britain. Um, so you ended up with a very similar pattern, you know, and then, you know, obviously, if you are the president of Nigeria, you need help doing that, right? You need you don't know how to set up shell companies yourself. You don't probably have time or the inclination. So so we have people who'll do that for you. And so there's an entire services industry grows up around helping people loot the world. Um, and then that obviously after 1991 and the end of communism, the opening up of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, um, yeah, that accelerates because you've got a whole new areas that, that were never under any kind of you know British control or, or domination, but who who wanted those same services or the rulers of them wanted those same services. So it becomes, you know, we became by default the sort of f financial center for unregulated money. And that isn't all criminal, right? Some of that is, well, okay, it isn't all evil. Some of that is, is tax evading money. So you have a sort of alliance between what you might call naughty money, which is, you know, tax dodging money, um, you know, corporations, who like to park their money in Bermuda because they don't want to pay US tax. And you've got kleptocratic money, but it all follows the same channels, it's moved in the same ways, it's moved in the same kind of structures. So so it, it's a, all the money is mm. moving through London. It's not just, if, if it were just a dirty money problem, we could solve it easily because you know it wouldn't have a very powerful protective lobby. But the fact is, is trying to dissect out the dirty money from the naughty money is really hard. I mean, is there a meaningful distinction between legal and illegal forms of tax avoidance because this is something which i go over again and again which is like if how easy is it to you know look at a tax avoidance scheme and go okay this falls foul of the law or this doesn't so i mean the, i mean the definition of tax avoidance is that it's legal so so the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance is that tax avoidance is legal um both of them are the same thing which is attempting to pay less tax um it's just that some of them are the right side of a very narrow line and some of them aren't and sometimes things which look legal are actually proven to be illegal and, and vice versa. So, you know, it, one, th one thing that I find really interesting was that, as, as I was saying, we were talking about houses that are owned by offshore shell companies, whether they're in the British Virgin Islands or, or Jersey or wherever, um, in order to try and discourage that from happening, because if you own your property offshore, you don't have to pay stamp duty when you sell the property, because you just sell the company that owns the property. And so it's very cheap way of, 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 of avoiding tax. That's how Tony and Cherie Blair got their nice Mayfair office. A lot of people have been doing this. I mean, it's a no-brainer if you can afford it. Um, so they created a special tax that you have to pay if you own your property via, you know, an envelope, an envelope, enveloped dwellings tax, which is to try and discourage this behavior. But that tax is so much lower than stamp duty that it's become basically uh, a pass to get away with not paying stamp duty. But that it, it's a pass that's only available who can afford to 
you know, you, you need to pay an entry fee to be eligible for that pass. And that's how all of this system works, that that you or me, I'm, I'm assuming you as well. Um, I, I don't have millions or yeah. billions. So we, we exist in, in, in a sort of, you know, in Britain, it's we have a tax system, we pay our tax, you fill in your tax return, I should have done mine, but I need to do it. Um, <laughs> all of that, like ordinary people. If we were richer, we would have access to a totally different sphere of operations where you can just pick and choose what laws you mm. follow and you can pick and choose which bits of the tax system you want to follow you can if you own your property in your name yeah you can pay stamp duty if you want to but look what's available if you don't you know look how much money you can save if you don't and that's how it all works you know you can say well you could own your money via a trust in south dakota um and look at how little money tax you'd have to pay or anyone would ever have to pay there's no inheritance tax forever you know it's it's an amazing opportunity for really rich people and quite hard, I imagine, to resist, right? I mean, if I were really, really rich and someone were to come to me and say, look, you know, you don't have to pay tax. You don't have to have any scrutiny over what you own. You can get away with all of this and it's completely legal. You have to be a strong person to say, you know, you know what, I'm not going to do that. You'd look up from your, you know, silver platter of cocaine and be like, yeah, that's, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, you've, I mean, going back to the sort of services which orbit um, this financial settlement that, yeah. that the UK is a part of. So thinking about like the super yacht captains and the, you know, yacht interior designer, but also things like PR. You know, the UK is home to, you know, Portland Communications who do PR for the Qatari government. You've got Bell Pottinger who didn't make, you know, meet a dictator that they didn't like and, you know, want to represent. How did that, spring up what why is britain such a home for the non-financial services bit of this conversation um it's all part of a of a spectrum i mean it's a very entrepreneurial space so you know if a if a wealthy qatari arrives in the uk you know they will be certain services which would naturally have to exist for them to come here sort of tax services and money management services but when they get here they're going to want to be spending money so initially you, you have places like harrods you know, which, I, as I understand it, used to be a shop for, you know, upper middle class British people, you know, and it would sell, I don't know, boats and things like <laughs> stuff which, you know, upper middle class British people wanted so they could be as well as an Amazons. Um, and, and it's become this sort of cathedral of, of bling um, <laughs> because so many people came from places like Qatar with so much money to spend that, that you end up with this very entrepreneurial approach to, you know, what else can we sell these people? You know, and let's say a journalist writes about them, then they need a defamation lawyer. And then a defamation lawyer realizes that, oh, look, what else we can offer? We can offer reputation management services and PR services. And we can do all of this as well. We can capture all that business. What's really interesting about, you mentioned the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, um, other remaining British colonies, they don't, we don't like to call them colonies, um, they're overseas territories. <laughs> I had an argument with a guy at the Foreign Office about this precise point, but they are, they're just, we've rebranded them, but they're still colonies, um, is that they have become big financial centers. You know, Gibraltar is a huge center of the online gambling industry, mm. you know, massive. Um, Jersey, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, BVI, Cayman, to a lesser extent, Anguilla, big centers of the wealth management, wealth movement, wealth hiding industry. That wasn't designed. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't someone in Whitehall who said, we need to find a way for these places to make a living. Let's do that. It was that there was a, you know, a demand from a, a, initially wealthy Americans to find a way of dodging tax, and they would ring up, they would ring around law firms in the Caribbean. What can you do for me? Um, so the story of the birth of the BVI Shell Company is the story of a phone call between an American lawyer and a lawyer in the BVI who who picked up the phone and said, "We need a shell company." I said, "Yes, sure, we'll do that for you." And then, so they got into business doing that, and then the government realized how much more money was to be made, so they passed a new law, um, co-written by them and the. American law firm to create a more attractive form of shell company. And that is the birth of the BVI. The Cayman Islands, the reason they're still British is Jamaica didn't want them. Mm. Um, you know, there was nothing there. It was a it was a place where, you know, primary income was generated by turtle fishing. Um, you know, what's it, a few thousand people, three specks of land between Cuba and Jamaica. Um but the governor there realized in a sort of attempt to develop them that by attracting American money that wanted to dodge taxes, they could create a new industry and went out of his way to encourage Americans to come on holiday and while they were doing it to talk to um, you know wealth management people and the Cayman Islands is now one of the world's biggest centers for fund management and it so it is a it, it, it's a constant entrepreneurial desire to sell more services 
you know, what else can we get from these people while they're here? I mean, there's something which you describe in the book, which is Britain in some ways is culturally unique because sure, we offer these services of, you know, concealing your money, cleaning up your money, uh, managing your reputation. But that process that you described earlier of you become a philanthropist, you sit in the House of Lords, you live like you're in Bridgerton, that is almost unique about the British cultural offering. Like the French and the Swiss don't offer I mean, that. that. So, I mean, there was a, um, I mean, there are little bits of this in other countries. Um, it's one of the, my, my favorite um, Brexit conspiracy theories is that the reason that we had Brexit is because the EU was going to stop us laundering money. Um, money laundering happens in the EU too. Um, to, to a large extent, it's just we're much better at it than, than they are. Um, so it, we you know, still make things in this country. Yeah, yeah, God damn it, we're still we're still world leading at this when it comes to criminal finance. We are top of the tree. And the, the so you know, for example, the ruling family of Equatorial Guinea, um, astonishingly light fingered bunch who discovered oil and, and made a lot of money. Um, they took that money to, or the, the son um, took that money to Malibu, uh, and and so he could live like a film star, and to Paris, where he bought huge houses in Paris, so he could live like a you know a French aristocrat of the old regime. So there are places in Europe that will do this, south of France to a certain extent, maybe a little bit in Spain. Um, but what Britain can offer is so great in terms of. Yeah, like you say, the Bridgerton thing, you know, you buy a place on Eaton Square, it may have a plaque on it saying that it used to belong to, you know, the Viceroy of India or whatever. Mm. It's like you are in a direct li line from all that. And then you've got, you know, the private schools, the, the universities, the art, you know, the art auction houses, you know, the yacht brokerages. You know, the, I have a friend who, who lives near the New Forest and after the sanctions were announced in um, Russia, it turned out that, that um, Many of his neighbours were super yacht captains. It was like a weird cluster of super yacht captains, and, they, and the, the, the the discussion was: Are we so? If we're sailing this boat um, and a sanction is announced while we're on the high seas, are we in violating sanctions or, or immediately, or, or are we allowed to get to port? You know, do we have to just dive off the boat? What happens? You know, <laughs> and like this, you know, all these people are just they're just out there, you know, maintaining their their sort of businesses in as, as very small fractions of this sort of corruption services butlering industry. I had a really fascinating series of discussions this year with um, a lawyer who had previously been on my, did you watch Game of Thrones? Yeah. You know, when Arya Stark goes to bed and she the list of people she's going to kill, you know, mm -hmm. if I'd had that kill list, you know, this lawyer definitely would have been in top <gasps> top three. I She 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 was part of a, of a defamation case that destroyed a film I've been working on for ages and I was furious about it. And um, But after the, san the sanctions came out, we got in touch for, for various reasons and went out for a cup of coffee. And it was really interesting talking to her about her perspective of working for an oligarch. Um, which in, and she's not sort of- How did she see it? She saw it that everyone has a right to legal representation. Um, people write scurrilous things about her clients and she has a duty to defend them from that. But and if you really believed in that, you would go, okay, I'm gonna do like legal aid criminal defense because well, these are the people who actually don't have legal I mean, representation. Interestingly, I think she does. I think she does both. Um, I mean, she's a, a genuinely, I, I really like her. She's a really nice person. It's just that, and interestingly, we, we both lived in Russia around the same time and we both had very, very similar kind of uh, formative experiences living in the former Soviet Union. Um, but she had gone in a different direction. Um, and it was fascinating because I think we have a, a tendency to ascribe bad results that they must have been done by bad people. Um, you know, that this this outcome is bad. So the person who did it must be like a Bond villain, you know, like sitting mm. around the table in, in the Spectre headquarters, you know, with their special rings on or, <laughs> you know, striking a white cat. But no, no one's a villain. Like everyone, everyone sees themselves as the good person. No, see, what I think is just that like, our integrity is much weaker than we think it is and can be bought for a lot cheaper. So I don't think that it takes spectacular evil. I think it just yeah. takes a, a bit of cash. And one of the things that American friends, I don't know whether you have this as well, but American journalist friends are always amused by how cheap British politicians are. It's like <laughs> they bought them for how much? Five grand at a trip to a race course? Sorry, what? Like, you know, say what you like about American politicians, but, you know, they don't get out of bed for, you know, a four-figure sum. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, they take they take a lot of buying. Um, and and that and, and that is a it is a notable feature of Britain that we're really we're cheap dates. Do you think do you think it's because of the kind of like, you know, Britain always 
prides itself on almost the amateurism of our politics, right? So rather than having these like huge glitzy town halls where, you know, Joe Biden's got his sleeves rolled <laughs> up and all of that, you know, ours is some kind of like drafty community yeah. center in Scarborough. I mean, I remember talking to Margaret Hodge, the Labour MP who did a lot to, I know she's not, not everyone likes her, but I think her work that she did um, exposing the misdeeds of, of big US tech companies when she was head of the Public Accounts Committee was incredibly valuable. And, and I think what she's done since working about criminal finance and dirty money has been brilliant. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan, but she, um, I once talked to her about when she was working at the Public Accounts Committee, you know, who was her research department? Where was she getting this information from? And she was like, private eye. <laughs> You know, that was, I mean, she had like a person and mm. private eye. So she'd read Richard Brooks's articles in private eye and be like, oh, looks like Starbucks are up to no good. Let's check that out. Yeah. You know, whereas I talked to people who work for the Senate subcommittee of investigations, you know, they've got like 10 Republican staffers, 10 Democrat staffers. Like It's huge. Like every senator has got four, three or four of their own people. You know, this is, it's like every committee that they have is staffed like the serious fraud office. <laughs> and, you know, and yet, and, and. And, and it's the difference is hilarious, and and we are, I mean, like spectacularly cheap, um, really, and and everything is done on a on a shoestring. I was just on on before I was here, I was chatting to a um, a former um, copper who about you know how Britain should and does investigate financial crime, and a really interesting role is played investigating financial crime by the City of London Police. Mm -hmm. um, the City of London Police is this totally anomalous police force that only exists because when they created the Met, the City of London Corporation was sufficiently influential to say, no, we want our own police force. So you have this tiny police force completely surrounded by the Met that, <laughs> that exists and you can tell them because they've got red and white yeah, yeah, yeah. checkers on their hats. And, um, and they have become the UK's lead force investigating fraud, um, sort of by accident, really. <laughs> like you'd never begin here. You'd never, and it's like this with so much of what, what we end up with, you know, you have these, you'd never start here, but all of it is kind of on a shoestring. You mm -hmm. know, there's no money for proper IT systems. You know, the, the officers are, you know, comparatively, com you know, compared to, you know, anyone who's working in a, uh, in a compliance department paid peanuts. And, um, and, it, and as a result, it doesn't really work. You know, you're not, we, we're not taking it seriously. And, and if we were taking it seriously, it wouldn't look like this. We might keep the City of London Police, but we'd give it proper resourcing and allow it to really go after fraudsters and kleptocrats and everywhere. But but we don't. And they, they do the best they can. But it's not, you know, obviously they, it's not enough. I want to go back just a, a step to the kind of um, Bridgerton, Eton, Winchester fantasy, which is now, you know, available if, if you've got the money. Um, how do, you know, the blue bloods and the aristocrats feel about it? Do they feel like it's a loss of status or are they like, at least there's money coming in? It, it's interesting. I was chatting, um, I was speaking at the literary festival the other day and um, and it was it was a very sort of high-toned literary festival. I actually spent the night before staying in the house of a former Tory cabinet minister. Dear which was God. lovely. <laughs> oh, the food was good. Anyway. It wasn't Edwina Curry, was it? Because you might want to avoid it the eggs. Wasn't, it wasn't. <laughs> It wasn't Edwina Curry. Um, it was it was very entertaining. But the um, anyway, it was a very very blue blooded literary festival and lovely, very friendly, and I sold lots of books. But the um, but talking to one of the guys there who recently retired from teaching at quite a big famous public school, and he was saying that you know back in the nineties, you might have one or two kids from overseas, might be a couple of kids from Hong Kong or someone from Malaysia maybe, but that was it. Whereas now you're looking at 15, 20, 25 percent. Um, it's really big business you know so are they a bit snooty i possibly but at the same time that's good money and what's what's entertaining about you know re but then reading about the history of say private schools if you read um like what george orwell writes about uh, boys weeklies and these sort of school stories you know that, that that were written for private school children in the 1920s and 30s is that you used to get the children of indian rajas coming mm. to to british public schools back then so none of this is new it, it fits into that you know that a sort of a, a really long um narrative which i think is part of the reason it's so attractive to russian oligarchs is they're fitting into that look you know i'm you know the new maharaja mm. you know and and that's I find all of that fascinating. You know, what are what were public schools? I mean, not all of them. Like Eton's older, but most public schools were created in the nineteenth century to train people to administer the Sudan or whatever. Mm. Like that's why you know they needed these you know lots of sort of athletic and slightly undereducated posh boys. Oh, it's kind of like a child abuse factory, right? It's like I'm going to make you capable of doing terrible things. Yeah, exactly. You're you're going to go out there 
and you're going to be the only British person for hundreds of miles and you need to be really conditioned not to go native because that would be awful. Yeah, you cannot recognize yeah. the humanity yeah, of you, people around you. Yeah, if you hook up with any of these women, like terrible things will happen. You'll <laughs> you'll get hair on the palm of your hands. You know, it's like, you know, and it, it's it in the fact that that has transformed into this. I mean, the most one of the most fascinating examples is this, is that there is a school in, I think it's in Worc Worcestershire, called Malvern College, which is, um, you know, it's one of the, you know, quite famous public schools, um, Malvern boys and Malvern girls. And, and they recently opened a branch in Egypt, mm. um, which was, and at the opening of the branch was attended by Tony Blair, who made a speech, and you can see it all on YouTube if you're so minded. I'm not saying I recommend it, but it is there. Um, and Tony Blair made a speech about how important it was to have cultural, you know, collaboration and yada, yada, yada. We've got Doha campuses now. But, for... but the thing about Egypt is Egypt is, you know, the rise of Arab nationalism, the the the, the, the nationalization of the Suez Canal. This is the death knell in the, in the <laughs> in, in, for the British Empire. This is this is what drove the stake through the heart of the British Empire was the rise of Arab nationalism. And, and you know, and the fact that, we have managed to wheedle our way back in to such an extent that one of the schools originally created to train the people who ruled that country has now opened a branch in Egypt to train their children how to rule their country. You know, it's an incredibly flexible entrepreneurial business. And, you know, this- General Nasser looking down like, wait a minute. Well, exactly. You can imagine, you know, General Nasser twitching in his grave when at, at, at the, this prospect. But, you know, but then, you know, um, uh, Mubarak's children had, property um not on Eaton Square, but you know, three minutes walk away. Mm. Um so this is a you know, it didn't it was take Saif long. Gaddafi's property on uh, I think it was like Billionaires Row, which got squatted and during he, the and uh, he Libyan gave, Revolution. And he very generously donated to the London School of Economics. Um and and so you do have this, yeah, I mean Gaddafi again, you know, the great anti imperialist revolutionary hero, you know, the the, the, the great anti imperialists in Russia in, in inverted commas, um mm. who 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 have put all their money here. It's, you know, we are, we are, I mean, there is quite an interesting symmetry in a way to Britain's hypocrisy towards this and Russia's hypocrisy towards this in that, you know, we talk about being a sort of a member of the Democratic Alliance, an outstanding member of NATO and, and all this while welcoming the anti-Democrats money into our property market and financial system in, in vast quantity. Meanwhile, in Russia, they are with the anti-imperialists, we're standing up to the West while they're sending their <laughs> money to the West in, you know, by the by the tanker full. And, you know, and, and they sort of fit together quite neatly in this sort of twin hypocrisies, which no one really wanted to acknowledge or examine. But I mean, could could you have in another country a uh, uh, Baron Lebvedev, you know, <laughs> sitting um, in the House of Lords, wearing the ermine, you know, He's Baron a, of Siberia. Like, Baron, could you have Baron, that happen somewhere else? Baron of Richmond and Siberia. Richmond and Siberia. It's like a character in Agatha Christie novel, isn't he? That, like, <laughs> the Baron, like a, you know, I need a Russian aristocrat, Baron of Siberia, you know, just check it. I mean, you know, what's fascinating about that is, is that, you know, Siberia isn't, it, it isn't actually a place. There is no place, Siberia. It's like, you know, there are, if you look on the map in Russia, there are lots of places that are called off Siberia or whatever, but but it's not like Hampshire. You know, there isn't, there isn't a, a, a geographic It's kind of like area. the North. Yeah, exactly. You know I mean? It's like it's Baron like of the North. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like, like, you know, Eddard Stark, you know, King of the North, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so it is such a bonkers thing to be. It's like a sort of, it is a pantomime title, but but could any other country have that? Um, look, there, there are plenty of countries of negotiable affection um, who will sell passports quite happily, mm -hmm. you know, places like Malta, um, in the Caribbean, St. Kitts and Nevis or, or Dominica, you know, and they, they do that. Um, and so we're not the only place that does that, but going to the extent of providing a permanent l for life seat in parliament, that is taking it to a new level. Um, who does that? I, I mean, it's hard to see. I mean, our constitution is very flexible like that. Mm. You know, you can, it, it sort of bends without breaking and, and sort of it, it's flexible enough to accommodate you know, the Baron of Richmond and Siberia. But then if you look at all the other people who who who've, who are in the House of Lords for services to the Tory party um, in recent years, you know, it's pretty shocking. I mean, he gets a lot of attention, you know, Baron Lebedev, which is entirely warranted. But sometimes I think that he, he, he probably, in a way, has justification to be a bit miffed that he gets, that the others don't get as much attention as him. Because, you know, they're... they're it, there's a whole panoply of these people who are who shouldn't be there. 
Yeah. And I, mean, I think it's a really good argument for reform in the House of Lords as well. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's wholly transactional. It's like, yeah. hmm, what did Ian Austin do yes. to warrant a seat in the House exactly. of Lords? Like, well, he helped deliver the Tories an election win. Um, I mean, I just sort of... Uh, just, and, and house, seat in the House of Lords forever. Yeah, for yeah. life. Yeah, for life. 300 quid a day. Yeah. And, and the weird thing whereby there are elected members of the House of Lords, um, they are hereditary peers elected by other hereditary peers. <laughs> it's like, how did we get there? You know, I, no one would start here. I mean, uh, again, thinking about this gap between the aristocracy sense of itself or royalty sense of itself, right, which is, you know, bloodline superiority. You are literally by virtue of birth better than everyone else. And yet, you know, Charles, uh, you know, in his previous job as Prince of Wales was taking a million quid from, um, you know, the patriarch of the Bin Laden family. I mean, it has has the business of being a blue blood always been this grubby and always been this um I, I guess running counter to its own ideals or is this an adaptation to deal with the ways in which britain lost its empire feudalism collapses we have a you know global financialized economy kind of thing well so i mean uh, there's two answers to that i mean one thing that i think is interesting about aristocracy as a system by which i mean the traditional form of it of these you know families that owned land for generations is that you know, they were given tremendous privileges. The transaction was that when we need you to do services, you will do services, mm. you know. And so you end up with a situation whereby in the First World War, a lot of aristocrats died. Um, it wasn't like in Russia where the people who are the barons around Putin, you know, when it comes to the shooting, no, they're going to leave that to, to they're poor. They're like, let's to get poor, some minorities to do this. ethnic minorities, they can do that. We don't do that. So there is a difference, um, you know, and, and there is a lot of sort of, you know, political theory about the, what the role of an aristocracy is in a traditional, you know, European society with, you know, essentially your, your people who, who over generations the, the royal family gives wealth and, and, and power to, because when, when we need you, we're going to really need you. So, you know, the traditional aristocracy, I can see that there is a role for it. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I can see there's a role for it. But this form of, you know, ersatz aristocracy, whereby you just can buy entry to it. It's become like a theme park, really. It's very grubby. Um, actually, it's a bit harsh on theme parks, isn't it? Because actually, they're incredibly tightly run and efficient organisations. Um, <laughs> it's going to be like, listen, man, yeah. I love Thought Park. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I went to the Harry Potter experience at the Warner Brothers Studios. Amazing. <laughs> but they yeah, genuinely highly recommended. Other theme parks are available. But um, so that, but that is, but then. If you look at the grubbiness, you mentioned the grubbiness. One thing, um, the, the Duke of Westminster, the current Duke of Westminster's father, um, and I don't know if they're the, I mean, they must be one of the richest families in Britain, if not the richest family. I mean, leaving aside the royal family, they are loaded. Do you know how upsetting it is also to see someone who's my age, who's a billionaire? Yeah, he's not really a billionaire, is he? I mean, when you say not really a billionaire, I mean, like, he wouldn't be like me, like, you know, going cap in hand to Halifax, being like, please, sir, oh, yeah, can okay. I buy one house? Yeah, he is really a billionaire, yeah, you're right. Yeah, right. he, 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 he wouldn't be Halifax, he'd have his own bank, probably. Um, but his father, when he had to fill in one of those, you know, documents saying, where's your money from and all that, like a you know, source of wealth. Mm. And, and he used to write very wittily pillage because <laughs> his family came over with the Normans and um, killed all the, you know, people at the Battle of Hastings and everywhere else uh, and just took stuff. You know, yeah, we'll have that bit. Yeah, we'll mm. have that. Thanks. And, you know, that isn't that different really to how Russian oligarchs make their money, you know, go into Novosibirsk and, you know, or, or Krasnoyarsk. And if you can't, if the other, if the guy who has it can't control it, you take it off him. And then, you know, it's pillage. You, you are essentially imposing your, your, your will on a landscape in a, in a really direct way. And, but then generations- You're just like the, the descendant of a cartel. Yeah, basically. but then generations go by and, you know, and you've, and you've been educated and, and, and you've got a nice suit and, and, and you don't, and now you're suddenly- the Duke of Westminster, rather than a, you know, frankly, probably blood spattered Norman maniac. I mean, do you, do you think that that's almost like, you know, so one of my favorite TV programs ever is Narcos. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's in some ways, it's always the classic gangster story, which is, you know, overreach, and then you're brought down, you forget where you came from, and then you're brought down, or you want to go legit. And that's when it all goes wrong. Like, do you think, you know, let's say, I made all my money in cocaine. Um, Ethically, it's not that different to coming over with the Norman Conquest and just, you know, slaughtering a load of villages and going, okay, this is my land now. But the difference is, is that as there is a system of law which will always put me on the wrong side of it. Not that cocaine doesn't warp and distort law, but... I mean, I think what's, what's crucial and different about the system of kleptocracy and the cartels and so on compared to 
previous forms of violent acquisitive crime like the Norman Conquest or whatever conquest you name, the British Empire or whatever, um, is that because of modern financial system and the modern and the, and the speed and ease of financial transactions, which is unprecedented and getting better all the time, um, you can rule, say, Nigeria. Um, but financially, you live in London. Mm. You know, it was one of the really fascinating things about when the COVID lockdown came is that you had a whole stratum of society in Nigeria who were used to having their medical care on Harley Street and suddenly they couldn't fly to London anymore. And what were you going to do? Like you didn't have the medical facilities for those people, um, you know, that to which they're accustomed. Obviously you had medical facilities mm. for ordinary Nigerians, but you know, good luck with that. So so it it's you've got a whole kind of ruling class for the whole world who who can exist. I mean my my previous book, The Butler to the World, is called Moneyland, in which I try to map this essentially virtual country for the super rich, which is everywhere and nowhere. And and in which you you have no responsibilities to any particular country, but all the rights and privileges that go with every country. And it's an incredibly intoxicating thing to have. So what's so, the threshold to enter Moneyland? Like what's the threshold of wealth if you had to give it a number? I mean you're definitely talking in the tens of millions. Okay, so it's not the thirty one K. No, I think you'd need a, I mean you could put down a down payment, but I think you 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 need to <laughs> you need to work a bit harder on that. But if you're but if you're running a cartel Right, it, it's you have you might be based in in Bogota or, or or wherever and be secure there and or, or in Medellin and, and stuff. But your money is at work in mm. Miami and in and in Singapore, and you are part of a incredibly efficient money laundering global money laundering system that moves value, you know, to China, to London, to the U.S., to Canada, down to South America. You know, it's. Seamless and it works as efficiently as the formal financial system. It's incredible, and the you know the hub of it, if it has a hub, you know the hub of it is here. Yeah, you know, this is it's it's the place where moneyland becomes as real as it can become anywhere because the services which are available in the UK, which can be offered particularly in London, but you know in and around London, are unrivaled anywhere. So yeah, obviously, you know Russian oligarchs right now aren't welcome here, and you know cartel bosses. Aren't welcome here. You know they are beyond the law, but everyone else, mm. you know, they're, they're fine. I mean, I've, I've read somewhere that you have had to really fight with editors to cover stories. You know, as you put it, you know, about countries with Zs in them. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you know, they're just not interested. I mean, can you think of a story which you think should have been a big deal, wasn't, and you were kind of banging the drum of it at the time? Um. I mean, well, th this 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 film um, that was that was uh, squashed by this the lawyer who was on my Ari Arius Stark list, <laughs> who I've now befriended. Um, that was uh, a really, you know, it was a it was slightly sort of spinach journalism. -y. It was important. It was something mm. you should, I felt that people should know rather than necessarily wanted to know. But but that was a, a story combining together the tale of a, a very wealthy politician from the recently deposed government in Ukraine who had money in London that mm. had been frozen and his battle to free that money and just entwining that story with the tale of a of a, a, a little girl and her mother in Ukraine. The little girl, um, Nonna, is a haemophiliac. Mm. Um, and if you're haemophiliac, you need regular injections of clotting factor. And under the Ukrainian constitution, she has a right to socialized health care. But because of the widespread looting of the Ukrainian health system, there was no money and therefore there was no clotting factor. So mm. so you have this politician who had been caught, um, you know, his money had been frozen by the serious fraud office here, and yet he was able to use his uh nous and his legal his access to to lawyers to to essentially uh release the money and and to be home free and he's fine now. It's okay. Whereas Nina and Nonna, the victims of the corruption, you know, life remained in, you know, all but impossible. You know this this constant struggle to keep her alive. I mean, to the extent that um, Nina, who slept next to her daughter every night, had trained herself to recognise the smell of blood. So if her daughter started bleeding in her sleep, Nina could be confident she would wake up. Oh my god! I know, and, and so you can never have a drink because you never know mm. when you're going to need to drive to to the hospital to look for the for the medicine that your daughter needs. She could never play with normal children because if she cut herself, who knows what would happen? If she bruised herself, who knows what would happen? It had become corruption. And the fact of this totally ordinary medical process, which we just take completely for granted, it was not available, had become the single defining feature in all of their lives. 
in not just their lives, but, but, but the other members of the family. They were all of them defined by this fact. And that was complete clear corruption. So that story, her story, which, you know, she, she didn't need to tell me. Um, and it was incredibly good of her to take so much time to talk about it. And then a lot of hard work uncovering the nature of the transaction, this $23 million that have been frozen here, and then not being able to tell that story because of um, the legal threats that were made to us and the fact that no one was prepared to take the risk of showing it was just incredibly frustrating. And it, you know, and it's happened a number of times. I mean, I've got better in a way, it's de depressing to say it, but I've got better at censoring myself to, mm. to, to the stories I try and tell to now remain below, below the line. Um, so I normally get them published. I'm, you know, Do you I, think if you were if you were in a country which had a constitutional protection for free speech like the United States, it would be easier to do this kind of work? Yeah, it would make a it's, it would be a, a game changer. I mean, there are there is discussion now um, <clears throat> in Whitehall and in various committees in Parliament to bring in what they call this anti slap legislation. And slap is this is a rather annoying term for that a, a lawsuit which is brought to suppress. Um, <clears throat> public participation, free speech, or whatever, um, which would be great. Um, I, I, you know, I've been part of some discussions about it. Um, I, I'm not sure yet that there is a recognition of what needs to be done. I mean, the the problem is not the law. The problem is the cost of mm. fighting uh, an assault against you. Um, and and the I was saying before this very entrepreneurial corruption services industry. You know, that extends into this defamation space as well. So one relatively recent innovation in this, or I mean, in the last four or five years, is the the repurposing of data protection rules, the GDPR, to become a, an adjunct to defamation law. So these these rules were brought in for very good reasons to protect ordinary citizens from the tech giants, right? That, that, but now know, if you're a journalist uh, and you're retaining data yeah, on or, somebody... Or, and not just journalists. In, in fact, in a way, almost more pernicious is... The gatekeepers of the financial system are these due, due diligence companies that if a bank wants, someone comes to a bank and says, I want to open an account, they will say to a due diligence company, do all the research into this person and tell us if, if they're okay. Um, you know, and, and they're specialized and they, you know, this is the work they do. And there are you know, dozens of these companies. And, and, it, and it's, they do really important work um, in terms of just making sure the banks know who, who they're banking. But, but now, because of GDPR, these companies are being targeted and they have no... You know, journalists do have protection under the law that there is a journalistic exemption which you're allowed to do stuff. These companies don't have that, so so they it's totally changed how they can do business. That because they are, you know, it's an incredibly expensive thing to defend yourself against, and very very difficult. And you know, so you have companies now who who you know the kind of names that you would know, the kind of names of companies that get named in Parliament for for helping bad people who who have entire teams now working on preventing due diligence firms from doing their job in order to allow their clients to get their money into the financial system. And that, you know, I'm, you know, as a journalist, obviously, I hate any sign of bullying against journalists. Um, but that is, in a way, almost more alarming, because it doesn't have, at least we, not always, but we to get a degree of public sympathy if we get attacked. You know, um, you know, what happened to Catherine Belton and Tom Burgess was appalling and, and really helped drive discussion that we need reform but but if you're a big due diligence company you don't get any sympathy i mean we've also seen this year how quickly things can turn so when russia invaded ukraine suddenly you had oligarchs being put on sanctions list you had assets being frozen roman abramovich was suddenly looking at chelsea looking like the team they deserve to be rather than the one who was able to fund them to be and there was a discussion about you know what kind of money does the UK make itself, you know, hospitable to and so on and so forth. For me, there was this huge honking irony at the heart of it that at that exact same time, you've got a takeover of Newcastle United, basically by Mohammed bin Salman. And do you just think that we are going to have the exact same conversation about, oh my God, isn't it dreadful? There's all this Saudi money here. How did yeah, it get here? Yeah. You know, in a decade's who, who, who time or knew? 15 years time. Who, who, who knew? How did that get here? Why did, why, did no one, why did no one tell me? Yeah, absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you're, you know, I, I was, not everything that's happened this, this year in response to uh, what Putin's done in Ukraine um, has been bad. Uh, we have had a couple of laws which are potentially 
you know, if if used, could be quite good. It's a big, quite a big if because we've had laws before that could have been good if they'd been used. But you know, still, it's something. It's not nothing. Um, but <clears throat> this, and a lot of you know, I think it's eighteen and a bit billion pounds of financial wealth has been sanctioned, and on top of that, quite a lot of real estate, which is not nothing. Um, that's good. Uh, though alarming that we had all that here in the first place. But well, what point, happens to it after it's been like sanctioned or frozen? It just, it just sits there. It just sits there. Yeah. So you can't you can't turn it into like. I don't know, like weather spoons or something of cultural value. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would be good, wouldn't it? The um, no, it just sits there. I mean, it is, you know, the the oligarchs do have access to money to maintain their lifestyles, or you know, these Russian gentlemen. So, and quite a lot of money. Um, Pyotr Avin, for example, I think gets fifty thousand pounds a month. I think a to, month. I think it's fifty. Yeah, to maintain his lifestyle, but he was cross about that because he wanted, I think, one hundred and forty. Um, I'll show him how to spend fifty grand a month. Yeah, well, you know, you don't have his outgoings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still like in the like reduced style of no, Sainsbury's, exactly, like yeah, a bum. No, Sainsbury's seriously, you need to be very least in weight if you want that kind of kind of value. But but um, he, you know, so but but so it has been good. It's not all been bad. And fair play to some, you know, members of government who have helped to push that through. And, and there are lots of good people in Whitehall who really understand the issue and, and, and try very hard to get it up the political agenda. Um, but. Uh, this is one of those things when you can ignore everything before the word but. The, what's been particularly frustrating is this has not been an assault on oligarchs. It's been an assault on Russian oligarchs. Mm. So, you know, other countries have oligarchs too, you know, not least Ukraine, as it happens. Um, you know, there are Ukrainian oligarchs who have been every bit as guilty of the destabilization and immiseration of their country as Russian oligarchs have been. And yet they haven't been targeted. Mm. You know, there are Kazakh oligarchs, Azeri oligarchs, uh, Kyrgyz oligarchs just from the former Soviet Union and that's leaving aside the entire rest of the world which has the same kleptocratic problems the same kind of you know uh, of ruling thieves who bring their money from there and spend it here I think you can sort of see when a country is amassed like um, a kind of critical concentration of oligarchs because then they suddenly host a Grand Prix <laughs> yeah or, or a World Cup <laughs> The um, absolute God, isn't it depressing? The last two World Cups, Russia and Qatar. It's like oof. I'm really struggling with the World Cup. Actually, off the point, but see, I'm from Wales, and oh my God, this might be the only one. Well, it's, uh, we haven't you... quali- we haven't qualified since 1958, way before I was alive, and and you know I really enjoyed the European Championships in 2016 when you know we we had this unexpected run to mm. the, the semi finals. It was amazing, and really struggling with with this with with the Qatar thing, and and you know particularly because you know my. You know, my kids really want to watch it and all that, and I don't want to be Mr. Killjoy. Basically. I mean, I mean, people will be watching this interview when when the World Cup is happening, and, and maybe this is actually a good conversation to have because I think that sometimes what, one of the things that social media has done is that it's given us the attention spans of goldfish, and it also means that we often forget the really long history of sports washing in football. I mean, Mussolini held a World Cup. Um, you know, those World Cups hit, hit held, held in, in Olympics. You know, held in. Brazil during the yeah. dictatorship and I think one of the things that made sports washing different in years past is that there were organized efforts against it so the sporting boycott of South Africa was an organized effort and it went on for years whereas one of the problems is you know you've got Qatar being awarded the World Cup in 2010 and then the talk of a boycott happens a week two yeah. weeks out and then you're like well what do you want people yeah. to do I mean though I mean I, I there's a um uh, podcast, a Malcolm Gladwell podcast that came out earlier this year about the 1968 Mexico Olympics and that iconic photo of the two um, athletes with, mm. their, with their fist raised. Um, and not for my shame, I can't remember what their names were, but um, but they and the story of that photo basically. And the you know, though there was a, there were organised efforts to bring the politics around it. There was also an astonishingly organized pushback. And I think we well, need to- the slaughter of the- Yeah, the uh, protesters. Mexican and civilians and-, and, and, and within, within the hierarchy. And I think, you know, that there is a, a huge effort to defang any kind of criticism of the Olympics. There is a, you know, a, a, a really, you know, FIFA is almost a state in its own right. This colossally powerful, wealthy organization co-opting and, and shutting down debate and, and all that. So, you know, you're right. I think it's been- it's, it is dis- distressing that there hasn't been a greater sort of debate around, you know, what should be happening in Qatar. But then, you know, look, in, in, it was Russia before, and 
you know, we now know everyone's now aware of the nature of Russia. R Russia hasn't changed. Russia was exactly the same then as it is now. You also know, after the invasion of Crimea. Yeah, and, and, and invasion of, of Georgia in mm. 2008, after, you know, Putin had sent murderers to kill Alexander Litvinenko with polonium-210, probably the deadliest substance in, in existence in the middle of London. And we were like, that's fine. Um, you know, David Cameron's over there. It's like on a trade mission as soon as he becomes prime minister. You know, after, after you know, all sorts of, you know, terrible things that he'd done to his own citizens and people elsewhere. And yet it's football. It's not political. Just, just enjoy it. Of course it's political. He wouldn't be spending hundreds of millions of dollars building stadiums if it wasn't political. So what, what do you think accounts for the moment where we collectively take our hands away from our eyes and we go, oh, this thing which has been in plain sight all this time is really awful. We've got to do something about it. Like what, what are the ingredients of that moment? I think it's, it, it's, it's when things start costing us money, to be honest. Um, you know, there was this... There was a wonderful. I, I've become really interested in effective altruism um, mm. since the. the Do you want to explain what it is very quickly? Well, it's effective. Effective altruism is like a totally banal concept, which is that if you are going to do good, you should think about the, the most effective way to do good. Right? It's totally banal and obvious, but it has weirdly become this sort of secular religion, particularly in sort of among tech people, that that essentially excuses however you accumulate accumulate your wealth because it, if as long as you're going to do good with it it doesn't matter how much harm you've done in accumulating it and it's been talked about a lot because of Sam Bankman Fried and the collapse of his you know tech, of his tech his empire. crypto polycule <laughs> yes the, the crypto poly crisis and oh God, I don't want to think about the whole that bit of it oh um but but there's this, this there was an article on the effective altruism one of their websites which was about him like a feature of, about him um and then at, at the end it, it, it had an additional paragraph saying you know uh, as of you know november uh, his his crypto exchange collapsed and we're we're very concerned about what people have lost money as a result and you're like you weren't that concerned, were you? Because, you know, you were all like, yay, it, until his empire collapsed. It was like, everyone's great. Isn't this wonderful? And then, you know, the you know, Sequoia, the, the venture capital money firm that put money into his fund says, you know, we're very concerned about the unexpected turn of events. You're like, unexpected? It's not, I mean, it, predictable. Like, I mean, you know, if only another 10,000 people had warned you there were issues with the crypto ecosystem. It's just so frustrating that you have you know, as long as there is money on the table, people are willing to overlook really obvious things. There was this, and what's interesting about it is it is, I think partly because of that book and film, The Big Short, mm. there's this idea that, that that you have a small number of clever people who realize what the problem is and a large number of stupid people who, who are just too thick to realize what the problem is. That I don't think that's true. I think what we have is a large number of people who realize that the, sy the system's whack, but it's so profitable that who cares? And there's this, this line from, I think it was the head of the US operations of Deutsche Bank, who before the 2007-8 financial crisis, and after when asked what their, you know, what their strategy had been, it was to keep dancing but stand near the door. <laughs> and that's the thing, right? Because, you know, the party is still fun. You know, there's still bonuses to be earned. It's not, you know, we know it's going to collapse, but right now, who cares? Because look, the money's flowing. And and that's the challenge is, is, you know, is how do you how do you somehow persuade people that while the money's flowing that they should turn the tap off rather than waiting until something so egregious has happened that that, you know, it, like like what you know, the Putin attacking Kiev in, in February, that something so egregious has happened. I mean, people call it the invasion of Ukraine. The invasion of Ukraine happened in 2014. Mm. Like, you know, it, it, it's been, they've been invaded for eight years already. It's, so it's a, it, it's something so egregious that you can't ignore it anymore. And, and that's what's difficult is trying to tell those stories in a way that grab people's attention. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, I think about a lot is the phone hacking scandal mm. and the moment when the Millie Dowler story broke and suddenly there was this, revulsion about phone hacking um and yeah in its essence the story hadn't changed it was the same story that the guardian had been banging on about for for ages um it's just suddenly because of the fact it had become insupportable at that moment but then what happened to levison too well right. exactly this thing and then you know but then yeah exactly. like you can have you can have a spectacle of, yeah. of accountability and, and nothing changes yeah. in fact the closing of the ranks between politicians and media i, I would argue is worse than than it's ever been. Yeah, I mean, you see, you see that situations with, with, for example, like the refugee crisis. I mean, we've gone a long way off the topic, but things like the refugee crisis, when suddenly you get one extraordinary photograph mm. of of a, of a tragedy, and and there's this huge outpouring of public sympathy and donations to all and sundry, and then a month later, everyone's forgotten all about it, and we're instead we're talking about sending the navy out to you know 
protect the English Channel as if it's the Spanish Armada coming at us, you know. Um, I mean, I think I, th- I think in some ways this is all part of the same story, which is the institutions of public life have been so warped by money, vast sums of money on the table, that their function then becomes to protect the interests of money. And it can be done in ways which are overt and obvious and ones which are more subtle. So something like the Leveson Inquiry, the recommendations don't get implemented, you never get the second half of it and ultimately nothing changes. But you get that beautiful moment of, of Rupert Murdoch getting custard pied and you're like, okay, there's been, there's been yeah. some level of, of um, justice, although it's not real justice. So what what would it take to break this cycle of, of, of actually restoring some some power to public institutions so they can do the jobs that they're meant to do um to actually bring money out of the you know shadowy world of money land to a place where we can see it and tax it and know who owns it um and maybe even redistribute it <laughs> well i mean it's it's an incredibly important question um i you know, if you're reading Thomas Piketty, and I'm not going to lie, I didn't read all of Capital. I tried, <laughs> but I ran it around after a little while. But I, I think I read enough to get the point. Um, you know, he's got this this famous equation. You know, that R is greater than G. So the return of in return on investment is greater than the growth rate of the economy over time. And so the rich will keep getting richer, mm. and the poor will keep getting poorer. And that's just how things are, um, and how they have always been. And that actually, the 20th century is the anomaly that is a time of relative equality. And actually, you know, if you look for with a longer time horizon that inequality is the natural way things are and you know it's a depressing argument uh, to be honest um but baked within it i suppose is the the argument that which he doesn't go into in the bit of capital i read but maybe he does later um <laughs> that the, the the people who who have the money and who have this high rate of return on their investment manage to capture the political institutions and prevent anything being done about this equation that that prevent it it being turned around so that doesn't happen anymore and in reality the only things that have ever managed to produce sufficient political impetus to force governments to sufficiently tax the very rich have been world wars and that's what's just also like the presence of like a communist bloc yeah i mean but but even those even those things came you know they, they came about as a result of you know the, the mm. communists came out because of the first world war you end up with these huge dislocations you know and so so anyway that leaving that aside what how do you try and make g greater than r rather than r greater than g what's the what's the mm. you know and, and and you know that i mean it's an it's a it's a it's a so colossal you know, as a, as a debate that, that it, you know, it, it makes you just give up, right? I mean, it makes, it puts me in mind of a question I got asked a, when I was t- t- doing a talk at a Sipform College once and one of the kids had been glowering at me from the back row. <laughs> he put his hand up right at the end. He was like, yeah, mister, if you know all this about money laundering, why don't you just go and do it? <laughs> and, and I still don't know what the answer to that is. It was a really, it's the best question I've ever been asked. I think mm. about it like every week. It's a brilliant question. Um, I think the best sort of answer I think I've ever heard kind of to that question is from a friend of mine called Daria Kalinyuk and I don't know if you remember but in the early months and weeks of the Ukraine crisis when Boris Johnson was loving you know mm. loving the fact that he could be Winston Churchill all of a sudden and he went to Warsaw and gave us a, a speech about how much we were doing to help and a Ukrainian woman stood up and started having quite a strong mm. go at him in amazing you know amazing fluent English and well and that was Daria mm. um, she's a she runs a anti-corruption action center which is a um an organization I'm on the supervisory board of and I think is the best anti-corruption group in the world, bar none. It's incredible. They do amazing work. Um, she's brilliant. And they face unbelievable difficulties now and before. And anyway, I once asked her basically the same question. I said, why bother? Like, if you know all this about money laundering, why don't you just go and do it? And, um, and you know, since the problem is so huge that we can never solve it. And her answer was, um, I don't think about the situation like that. You know, right now we are at four percent of where I want us to be. My ambition is to get to five. Mm. I so, was also think that there is something about. Um, I think this is a earlier uh, yippy quote, which is, you know, we never lose this one essential freedom, which is to do what is right. Yeah, and you always have that choice. And there is that little Jiminy Cricket inside of you, and it, that Jiminy Cricket can get his mouth stuffed with gold, and you can yeah. make it easier to ignore him. But I actually think that yeah. So I mean, you know, so there was a there was a Russian dissident called Andrei Malryk who said it's a similar line, which is that live like you live in a free country, um, and which I really like. Um, and you know, and it was a in, it was an incredibly subversive thing to say in the context of being very persecuted um, in in the sort of Brezhnev early Brezhnev era in the Soviet Union. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. You know, just don't fall for effective altruism. <laughs> don't fall for that. You know, and and all that. But but in terms of the scale of the challenge, 
you know, how do you simultaneously overcome, you know, kleptocracy in in Russia and Nigeria and Egypt and Malaysia and, you know, acquisitive dictatorship in China and, you know, the rise of oligarchy in the United States and, you know, an increasingly corrupted Tory party in this country and so on. How do you overcome all of this? Well, you can't, you can't not all at once. But you can still get from four to five percent. I'm starting to think that Robespierre had made some points, yeah. you know. No, but look what happened to them, though. I mean, it, that 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 went. That's the problem. It's it, it, it. I'm I'm. I think then it went even worse. You know. I don't know. I'm a, I'm an, an evolutionist rather than a revolutionist. I'm afraid. I'm on a let's just roll the dice. Man can't get any worse. That's well, a. I, I can see how I can. Uh, it's it's certainly a, a valid point of view. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that can be a conversation that we continue another time. <laughs> um, Oliver Bullo, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. It's been brilliant.